This is Jim Cornette, wrestling legend and all-around nice guy. And you are listening to WGD, Wrestling's Glory Days Weekly with Steve and the Scum. I recommend this program highly, especially if you have nothing better to do. Hey everybody, welcome to WGD Weekly with Steve and the Scum. My name is Steve and what an intro we just listened to. That's Jim Cornette. He is our special guest today, so I'm absolutely excited about that. I know my man the Scum is. What's happening today, brother? Well, Steve, always a pleasure to be back with you, my longtime tag team partner. It's always a pleasure to work alongside the great folks at Wrestling's Glory Days over on Facebook. Like you always say, the, the best content for internet wrestling, old school Glory Days of Wrestling. Check them out on Facebook. Check us out on Facebook. And Steve, I've been saying the last few times, it's always nice to tag in a six-man partner, but today we'll go with the man in the corner that maybe if we need a little to take a shortcut, maybe he can uh, reach in, get his hands around the throat of somebody, or maybe waffle someone with that tennis racket. Speaking of waffles, I think they uh, serve a delicious frozen treat in a waffle cone down at the Dairy Queen that this guy's been associated with from time to time. Uh, James E. Cornett, what, what a thrill to have him on. I know he's one of your favorites, Steve. He, Mine too, but I know you're a corn, big cornet guy. You've got to be ecstatic this week, my friend. Oh, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And I'm glad that we're able to have a guy like this on our show who's, you know, spent managing the Midnight Express, multi-time tag team champions, maybe one of the best promos ever, certainly in my opinion one of the best promos ever. Just a guy that is never at a loss for words. I, I love his analogies, the stuff he says. He's just a funny guy. So I find him entertaining. Certainly, like you said, Scum, one of my favorite guys. He's also the author of Rags, Paper, and Pins, The Merchandising of Memphis Wrestling. That's co-written by Mark James, who also, for classic wrestling fans, check out this site if you have not yet, MemphisWrestlingHistory.com, filled with great stuff, great memorabilia, uh, check it out, and of course, we all know we all know what we can expect from Jim Cornette, and that is great stories, and that's what we're here to do. Once again, thank you for listening to WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum. You know what you're going to get from us. Always classic wrestling. Don't focus too much on the current product. Never give anything away. And all of our guests, as you can see, straight from the heart of the glory days of wrestling, Scum. Yeah, Steve, uh, one thing that you usually throw in there that I think maybe you were setting me up to jump in on, you usually say, you know, you're not going to hear any spoilers here. Well, guess what? I'm going to throw you a little spoiler alert, as all of some of our listeners might be familiar with that term. We got James E. Cornette here today on the program, in a program that's sure to be, I don't know, let's say a equivalent to the Wendy's Triple with Cheese. Big time show here. Well, I, I know that's one of Jim's favorite uh, snacks when he's out on the road. But anyway, the spoiler alert that I'm talking about, this is only the beginning with Jim Cornette because James E., the Louisville Lip, has agreed that this is part one of a part two series with Jim Cornette. So for our listeners out there, this is not the end. If you listen to today's show, there's going to be plenty more to touch on with Jim Cornette. He's never at a loss for words. Oh, you know it's coming. That second part is going to come down the line a little bit, and that's going to come out in, coinciden in coincidence with his new website, or his website makeover, that is, jimcornette.com. That website still is up and operational, so go check it out. Order his book. Check out some of his other products there. I know he's got a couple other things going on, but his website is in the middle of a facelift, and when that is all done and ready to be presented to the classic wrestling fans all over the world, we are going to have him back on our show, which is great. But, Scum, we got a couple of guests upcoming that I'm pretty excited about, another couple of great storytellers and guys that have gone on after their careers to just, you know, be great guys, uh, guys you don't hear about in the bad part of the dirt sheets that we all read about on the Internet. we got... Tugboat coming up next week. Fred Ottman, the legendary Shockmaster. And the week after that, Scum, another guy from our region. And you want to let the fans know who that is? Yeah, absolutely. We got, like you said, Uncle Fred, the Tugboat, the Typhoon, former World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Champion with the late 
John Tenta, the earthquake as part of the natural disasters. Fred Ottman is going to be on the show next week. And then following that, one that we're real excited about, a man that hopefully, maybe with the rumblings, might even take his rightful place in the Hall of Fame with WWE this year, and that's the Russian bear Ivan Koloff, the man who finally put an end to Bruno Sammartino's seven-and-a-half-year reign, the man who had a reign of terror over the Mid-Atlantic and the Crockett promotions with his nephew Nikita. Uh, the, the, the stories, that the possibilities there are endless. Cannot wait to sit down with Ivan Koloff. That's two weeks from today. I can't wait for that either. And you know, Scum, I think uh, you, he's an ordained minister. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, we're going to move on. Guys, listeners, we wanted to thank you very much. We have uh, all in total over 1,000 total followers on all media outlets. We have 700 followers plus on Facebook, 300 on Twitter, and we're over 3,000 total views on YouTube, all thanks to you guys. So thank you very much for listening to our show. As you can tell by now, we just like to sit back and listen to some of the greats from the classic glory days of professional wrestling, tell some great stories. And uh, we wanted to thank you all for listening in. Scum, we got a lot going on still. Not so much this week, but in the near future here, coming up at the end of November, I know you wanted to share with everybody what we have happening up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, WrestleCade. Tell us a little bit about that and what we got going on there. Yeah, that's uh, November the 30th at the Benton Convention Center in Winston-Salem will be the first public appearance of Stephen the Scum representing WGD Weekly. And sitting front and center with us will be the former ECW World Heavyweight Champion, Just Incredible. He'll be there to meet and greet the fans. And later in the evening there, Steve. There's a wrestling card, some big-time matches. The first ever WrestleCade Championship, I believe, is a ladder match between Matt Hardy and Carlito. And our guest, Justin, was just signed on recently to be the special guest referee in a return match from the classic ECW I Quit bout between Tommy Dreamer, who is Justin's longtime rival, and C.W. Anderson. And how's this for some of you Glory Days fans out there? In C.W.'s corner, will be not only Steve Carino as an advisor, but James J. Dillon will be his manager for the night, kind of revising a few years back on the indie circuit. Justin and Carino and CW were a part of a group called the Extreme Horsemen. So J.J. Dillon will be in the corner there. So all that's going on at WrestleCade. Check them out, www.wrestlecade.com. You can see the full lineup of who's going to be there. Tons of stars. I believe it's up over 70 stars that will be there for the Fan Fest. Huge event, and a huge event as far as the wrestling card goes, too. And our man Justin is going to be there right in the main event as the referee putting on the stripes. I mean, as he might say, Steve, it sounds like WrestleCade with Steve and the Scum, with WGD Weekly. Won't just be the best, won't just be the coolest. Listeners, WGD Nation, Scum Nation, it'll be just incredible. That's right, Scum Nation. Check that out. And uh, again, now, classic wrestling, we got to deal with modern technology. So hashtag Scum Nation. Look that up on Twitter. You'll find us all over the place at WGD Weekly. Pay us a visit there. Give us a follow. We always got some good stuff going on. We try to do, and again now, Scum on Facebook, I've noticed that uh, my man over here has a couple of different segments throughout the week, and definitely tune in on Wednesdays for that. Tune in now on Fridays. you got a new little special there, Scum. I see you're working hard. Our new program director, I think. But as we're talking about ECW, we're just incredible there. Something kind of occurred to me. I think now, I, and my memory is a little bit bad. We, he don't, I don't think he was ever in ECW. I'm looking through the lineup of the federations that he was in. Check this out. WCW, of course, WWE, of course, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Mid-South Wrestling, Ring of Honor, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, Dallas, uh, Ohio Valley, of course, the old classic Georgia Championship Wrestling. I, I bet you he went to Florida at one point. He guy's been all over the place. Now, had he, did he touch base in ECW? Uh, I'm not really sure, Steve. I, 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 I could be mistaken. I think somewhere around the time that he was doing Smoky Mountain that they may have had some interaction there with Eastern Championship Wrestling before Shane Douglas tossed the strap in the garbage there and uh, they went on to become extreme and carve their niche in wrestling history. I'm not positive of that. Again, I, 
I, I want to say that there might have been some interaction there with the old NWA at the time and the Smoky Mountain and Eastern Championship Wrestling, but I'm not really sure. I do know that the guy who kind of got pushed out the door there as the NW, head of the NWA was involved with Cornette when he did that NWA invasion angle with Barry Windham and Jeff Jarrett in the Rock and Roll Express back in WWF in the Attitude Era, but I'm not really sure. I'm not positive on that, but he has been everywhere else. I mean, it would make sense if he was there. And shoot, I mean, when, when his mouth is, when his gums are flapping, there ain't many that are more extreme than Jim Cornette. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, I didn't want to ask ask a question there to stuff the scum, but as we're on that subject now, Arlene Wilson didn't send us a great pic of her with, uh, with I guess, with her cat, with the with the new book that she got, Wrestling with the Devil from Lex Luger. This week's book, of course, Jim Cornette, Rags, Paper, and Pins, and Merchandising of Memphis Wrestling. Very interesting read there, so pick that up. But Scum, as we were talking about Stump the Scum and Steve's Gimmick Garage Sale, both of our listeners have received their gifts, very happy campers, and I know that we have a couple of things upcoming soon that we will release at a later date, but keep tuning in because you never know when Steve and the Scum are going to give away some really cool prizes, especially, and I got a real funny feeling after Russell K, that we might have a few choice pieces of merchandise that maybe we might want to part ways with with some of our readers and listeners. So thanks again for listening to WGD Weekly with Steve and the Scum. I know we got a lot going on each week. This week's going to be kind of a quick week for both myself and the Scum. we got a lot of irons in the fire, as we always say on our show. we got Jim Cornette due to call in here in a few moments, Scum. But take us through what it's been like since the start of this thing as, as we've been kind of gaining a lot of momentum. If you look back, over the last month, you know, a little bit of self-promoting this week. I guess this is what we do, and we don't have a lot of other stuff to talk about this week. But if you look back, Larry Zabisco, Lex Luger, we had Alex Wright, now Jim Cornette, followed by Tugboat Typhoon, Fred Ottman, and then Ivan the Russian Bear Koloff, and many more to come after that, Scott. Yeah, Steve, again, we're not ones that like to tip our cap too early, but let me just say this. On top of that coming up, after the legends that you just named, just off the top of my head, I can think of two WWE Hall of Famers, three, make that three WWE Hall of Famers, three inter, former Intercontinental Champions, and one man that may be one of the most popular personalities right now, given the interaction that he's having across the Internet, and let's say in a rebirth of sorts that's coming on, Plus, we have several other guests that are coming up that will just blow your mind. I, I, I mean, the, it, you said the, the momentum that we've gained, the uh, steam that has accumulated behind the show. We really appreciate everyone jumping on board, um, the followers on Twitter, the likes on Facebook. The numbers speak for themselves as far as the people viewing and listening to the show, and I just couldn't be happier, you know. You said not one to uh, self-promote. Well, I am. I'm one to self-promote, and like I've said all along, people might have thought it was some kind of a tagline, but safe to say that not only the scum, but WGD Weekly, you as well, my friend, hard to argue that they are the latest sensation that's sweeping the wrestling radio nation, baby. Oh, you, usually this is where I'm going, oh, please, but, but this week I think I'm going to agree with you, brother. We got... A lot of stuff, like you mentioned, coming up here in the near future. You don't want to miss it. Now, we said we said at the end of last week's show, you don't want to miss this week. And what do you got? We got Jim Cornette. So when we're saying this to you, trust us. Like, a, like another famous WWE, soon-to-be Hall of Famer, I hope, who says, trust me. All right, folks, it's that time we've all been waiting for. Grab a nice cold Sprite and put the kids to bed and dig in. We got Jim Cornette on the line. Can't wait to get into talking about him. He's got a new book coming out, Rags, Paper, and Pins, The Merchandising of Memphis Wrestling, by Jim Cornette, co-written by Mark James. If there was a wrestling federation in the 80s, this man was in it. Has plenty of stories to tell. We're going to do a little bit of intro tonight, and we got him back for a part two already, so we're really psyched about that. So without further ado, we got James Cornette on the line. How's it going tonight, Jim? 
Guys, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm doing great. I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm looking out the office window at my new landscaping I just had put in. But now the rib's on me. i got to spend an hour and a half every day watering the stuff. <laughs> That's always fun. <laughs> well, give us a little backstory on your new book here, Jim. Well, actually, uh, you said it's coming out, but it's already out. It's available everywhere. Um, uh, Mark James, who does the Memphis Wrestling History website, you can go to memphiswrestlinghistory.com, uh, is a is a, a great friend of mine. We both grew up as tremendous Memphis wrestling fans. And uh, when he came up uh, to the house last winter and spent a couple of days, he said, geez, I see about six books here without even flipping through the stuff, you know, the, the collection I have in my vault. And the first one we decided to do, it, it's, it's an uh, amalgamation of things. It's a, an autobiography of my days as a teenager before I started a, as an actual manager in professional wrestling. I started out by being the ringside photographer in, in the uh, Memphis territory, Louisville and Nashville and Memphis and the cities around the area. Took all the pictures, wrote most of the programs, published my own magazines. And uh, Memphis was on the cutting edge when it came to merchandising uh, wrestling memorabilia. Uh, before you could get titantrons and action figures and you know wrestlers' pictures on underwear and bed sheets. You had to buy this stuff in the arenas back in the old days, and Memphis was on the forefront of selling programs and, and, and color pictures and uh, their own magazines and, and different variety of uh, ephemera and memorabilia, including wrestlers' records, uh, Memphis being the birthplace of the blues and the home of rock and roll. A lot of the top uh, main event stars actually released records uh, that did quite well on a mainstream basis. So we went back and in our extensive collections started about 1950 with the uh, arena programs and, and brought it up to the glory period of the 80s. Uh, the programs and magazines and pictures that haven't been seen in 30, 40, 50 years reproduced, plus, as I said, not only an autobiography of my teenage years, but also an inside look at the money that these guys were making on, uh, on you know, the souvenirs that were sold at the uh, merchandise stands in the arenas. Uh, we did a year-by-year -year, uh, wrap-up of uh, Memphis business, including big gates and crowds, top rivalries, main event stars. It's really a cool book, 350 pages. You can get it at jimcornett.com, along with my Midnight Express 25th Anniversary Scrapbook, which is still available for those few of you who don't have it, and a lot of other cool stuff. Or you can go to memphiswrestling.com and get all the Memphis wrestling information it's even available on amazon soon to come to a 7-eleven near you this book's all over the place like coca-cola unbelievable stuff now it's ironic that you were uh, talking about a lot, so much about the mid-south mid-south coliseum memphis wrestling i ran into a uh, person the other day at a friend's birthday party he said he lived just a, and and this was his words across the tracks from the Mid-South Coliseum. So I'm not quite sure what that exactly means, but he mentioned that they were going to be tearing that building down. Is that correct? Well, you're, you're a northerner, aren't you? you got to be a Yankee. If you don't know well, what living across the tracks means, basically that's, uh, there, there's good parts of town and bad parts of town. And if you live across the tracks, generally you're in a bad part of town. But uh, the Memphis Mid-South Coliseum was the premier wrestling arena, in uh, actually the premier arena in the city of Memphis for... 30 years until they built the new pyramid, but uh, uh, the Mid-South Coliseum hosted more live pro wrestling events and probably uh, sold more tickets to those events than almost any major arena in any major city in the country uh, over a period of, of 30 years from the time that they uh, opened up uh, the Coliseum for wrestling in 1971 until uh, about 2000 when it, uh, it ceased being used for most purposes. They've been trying to tear it down for years down there, but it's, it's such an, uh, a cultural, iconic landmark in Memphis that uh, every time they try to tear it down, they get a backlash from the public and people start uh, signing petitions. So hopefully, uh, you know, that great old building will be there for many years to come. Well, that's fantastic. And, now, and just as a matter of record, very much a Yankee, very much knew what the other side of the tracks meant. However, when that guy told it to me in particular... I literally thought there may just be some railroad tracks right there, but thanks well, there, for there's that probably out for. there's probably a few around, but there's also a few neighborhoods that even if there's no tracks, they'd be on the wrong side of them. Oh boy, I've been through Memphis twice, and I understand exactly what you're saying there, my friend. Let me turn you over to the scum here. I know we had a couple of questions he wanted to ask you. All right, Jim, I uh, wanted to thank you for being with us here tonight again. Uh, well, th pleasure. thank you for having me. I always enjoy being had. 
<laughs> well, that uh, interesting comment there, but we would expect nothing less from you. I guess what we're going to do, what we usually do, is run through the careers of our guests. Um, and yours is certainly a long and storied one. We're lucky that we have a couple of segments here with you. So I guess we'll start right out from the beginning then. Um, obviously, anyone who has ever seen or heard you of you in any capacity can tell one thing, and that's the passion and great pride in the sport of wrestling that you have. This would certainly come from your beginning as a fan of Louisville growing up. Uh, tell us how Jim Cornette first becomes enthralled with pro wrestling and explain how you being the biggest fan in Louisville would pave the way for your involvement in the sport. Well, actually, uh, I'll, I'll give you the short version. And once again, the longer version is available in rags, paper, and pens, the merchandising of Memphis Wrestling. And you know that title, everybody goes, what, what in the world is that title all about? Uh, it comes from a quote by Sputnik Monroe, who was the first great uh, box office draw in Memphis Wrestling in the late 50s. He still holds, not Jerry Lawler, but Sputnik Monroe holds the record for the most people ever to see a wrestling match in the city of Memphis from his 1959 match with Billy Wicks. But Sputnik was also the guy that was an integral part of integrating uh, sporting events of all kinds in the South. Um, he was so popular with the black audience who at the time of segregation could only sit in the uh, upper balcony of the Ellis Auditorium back in those days. And uh, he basically went on strike uh, when there were empty seats down below, but they were turning people away. Uh, he said, uh, hey, you know, his payoffs uh, uh, basically uh, were based on the, the crowd, and he said, if they won't let my black friends in, I'm not going to wrestle. And he was too important to business at the time to turn him down, so they started letting the black folks in Memphis in uh, uh, more than just the crow's nest up in the upper balcony, and, and nobody had any riots, and there was no problems, and, and that led paved the way to the integration of all public and, and especially sporting events, but uh, he always used to say when, the, uh, when the, the good guys, the heroes, the baby faces would be on their way out to uh, the merchandise stand to sign autographs and push their gimmicks, he said, well, there they go, Pally going to sell their rags, paper, and pens, and we thought it was a, a very apropos title, and I got started the same way. Uh, I, I was actually, uh, my mother was up sick with a cold one night, very late on a Saturday night, and watching TV, flipping around the channels, and she told me the next day, Jimmy, I, I saw a, a wrestling program last night, late at night, that looked just like the programs that used to be on television when I moved to Louisville in 1951. And it had, this was 1971 at the time. It happened to be Dick the Bruiser's show from Indianapolis that you could get back in those days when nobody had cable, and the, the, the VHF station was about 80 miles away, so you got a snowy picture, but you could see it, and son of a gun... Not only was it like the uh, the program she used to see in the early 50s, but it had the same talent, Wilbur Snyder and Dick the Bruiser. You know, they didn't change their talent a lot back then. And uh, I asked her if I could stay up the next week and watch it, and she let me. And I instantly fell in love with the Black Jacks and Bobby Heenan, Dick the Bruiser, the Crusher, Ernie Ladd. And uh, then I found out there was wrestling on in Louisville because Jerry Jarrett had just opened the city up the year before and, and put the... Uh, the Tennessee wrestling tape on here in Louisville and saw Jackie Fargo and Kurt and Carl Von Brauner, the interns and Dr. Ken Ramey, Tojo Yamamoto, Jerry Jarrett, and I was hooked. And it was just a few years later that I was able to strong arm her into taking me downtown to the Louisville Gardens to see the matches that, that uh, took place every Tuesday night. And from there, it was only a year or so that we were able to get front row seats and I started taking my Kodak Instamatic camera and it was only a year or so after that that for my birthday, I was still, I was, I think this was for my 14th birthday, but I got it early. Uh, I, uh, I got a 35 millimeter camera, started taking better pictures. And then a lady named Christine Jarrett, who was Jerry Jarrett's mother, he was one of the top wrestling stars and also the, the booker and actually spearheaded the northern expansion of the Tennessee Territory into Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, Evansville, Indiana. Uh, Miss Teeny, as everyone called her, was his mother, Jeff Jarrett's grandmother, and uh, she, you know, she saw this little 14-year-old kid running around buying everything that was available on the souvenir stand and and asking a lot of questions, and and uh, uh, she uh, ended up uh, uh, giving me little chores and tasks and errands to do, and then saw my pictures and. She said, you know, I believe these will sell on the merchandise stand because back then it was the old black and white 8x10s of questionable quality, produced very cheap, and 
here came these color four by six prints and uh the rest is history as they say on many of the talk shows uh the eight by tens quickly went away replaced by my color pictures i gradually started doing all the ringside photography for the uh, the local programs as well as magazines like the Wrestling News and later Bill Apter's London Publishing Magazines, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, The Wrestler, Inside Wrestling, uh, then started publishing my own magazines, all of which are reprinted in rags, paper, and pens for the first time in 30 years. And uh, that was my entree for uh, about seven years from the time I was 14 until I was almost 21. I was the part-time ring announcer, full-time photographer, and all-around gopher, and then one day Jerry Jarrett asked the fateful question, you've been around here for so long, everybody knows you, you want to be a manager. And uh, that was how it got started. Very good. Interesting stuff. And a very apt title for the book, given that story. Exactly. Now, uh, we're moving on here. And, and, you know, you touched on something real quick. Um, and, and this was a, a part of the gimmick for the Jim Cornette character for a long time, uh, you know, go cutting your teeth into the business as my as the mama's boy mama Cornette. my mama always used to say as a matter of fact we did a show last week uh we called it the beatnik body slam and we would take an old promo and throw some scat music by it and i picked one of yours and you were talking <laughs> about jimmy valiant and oh some guy took uh rocky you, king rocky, rocky king, king. Yeah. Oh, that was a fantastic Well, But you mentioned your mom in that as well. Long story short. So where is the idea to bring you in as this type of character with the, with the Mama Cornette and all that? Where, where does that actually happen? Well, actually, Jerry Jarrett was very uh, adamant that everything that they did in their booking should have a, a, a root in fact, should be something that people could, you know, believe. And since I had been going to the matches uh, for so long, especially in Louisville, but also in Evansville, because as my photo empire grew, my mom started being uh, one of the people who would sell the pictures at the uh, at the merchandise tables every week. And back then, once again, just the volume when you had you know eight or ten thousand people every week in Memphis and three or four or five thousand every week in Louisville, the volume of these one dollar and two dollar and three dollar pictures was enormous. So we we actually figured out that the folks who sold Pictures at the merchandise stand in Louisville on Tuesday nights made about four thousand dollars a year just on their ten percent commission in cash for three hours work a week. But um, uh, I had I, I was so young I didn't have a driver's license, and if I was going to get to the events, my, my mother had to drive me. And as she you know gradually started selling pictures at the merchandise stands, and, and she and Christine Jarrett became great friends. Uh, so. She was always around, and uh, the people recognized her and knew her. And you know, she was actually very popular. As a matter of fact, when I first got started in managing, uh, you know, she had to stay home because that was part of the deal. She got he's got this rich mother, and uh, for all the towns that she used to go to up here in the northern end of the territory, uh, I had more heat because people would say, "Your mother is so nice. She's got to be ashamed of you. What you're doing." <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Jarrett wanted to uh, he wanted to update the old Playboy Gary Hart gimmick. Gary Hart supposedly, when he first started in wrestling management, came from a wealthy family in in Chicago, and and that's how he bought his way into wrestling. And of course, he was Playboy Gary Hart. The people wouldn't believe the Playboy part for me, but they believed that I was this clueless rich putz that my mother bought my way into everything that I wanted to do. I'd never worked a day in my life. Had nothing in common with the. The you know the hoi polloi the 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 common people of 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 wrestling, and uh, so it was a great great way to introduce me from just being this you know teenage ringside photographer to suddenly how did I get in wrestling? Well, that was the way. My mother was loaded; she had a bunch of money, and to this day, Mama Cornette remains the most famous, the most talked about, the most recognized wrestling personality that never actually worked a show, appeared on a television taping, or even had her picture printed in a program. Nobody ever saw her. She never did a single angle, but everybody remembers Mama Cornette. Absolutely. I'm sure my I'm sure at one point my mama got questioned about <laughs> my uh, actions as well. So we're in the same boat there. Either way, speaking of early gimmicks from way back and the origins of them, got to ask before we move along, where does the tennis racket come from? How does that come into play? Well, you know, once again, it was pure happenstance, just like all the good stuff that happened back in those days. Um, 
I, I was in Memphis for about 14, 15 months when I first got involved in wrestling as a manager before Bill Watts came to, uh, to Memphis, and he and Jerry Jarrett agreed to make a talent trade. And I was chosen to go to, to uh, Mid-South Wrestling in Louisiana with the Midnight Express. And the one thing that I'd always heard was how violent and, and dangerous the crowds were down there, the Cajuns in Louisiana and the Cowboys in Oklahoma and Texas and the Rednecks in Mississippi. And, boy, if anything, the stories were understated. And everybody told me, Cornette, they're going to kill you. You're going to have so much heat, they're going to kill you. So right, right as we started doing Mid-South Wrestling Television, flying down from Nashville, I, uh, on a rare day off, I took my girlfriend to uh, a movie. This was uh, November of 1983. It was the time where all the teen movies, you know, The Breakfast Club and Sixteen Candles, whatever, were going on. And this movie, the rich kid in the, in the group always carried a badminton racket in every scene. And now re- wrestling managers had done umbrellas and canes and books and briefcases, but nobody had ever carried a tennis racket. And I figured this can have a dual purpose. Not only can we use this in the ring, but also I can get some reach on these fans that are going to be attempting to physically, physically attack me, and, and I can get some reach on them and bop them in the head and hopefully uh, you know, then make a break for it. So that was I, I presented it to Bill Watts. I said, I'm a rich kid. Shouldn't I carry a tennis racket around like I just came from the country club? And he said, sure. And that's, he gave it the blessing, and that's the way it got started. And now to this day, uh, people who don't remember my name still remember, oh, you're the guy that carried the tennis racket. And we used it a lot in the ring. And believe me, I used it a lot outside the ring when we were being physically attacked by you know, various fans. That's incredible. Not a story that goes by when we're on the show and talking to some of the greats from back in the glory days of wrestling. So we talked to Larry Zabisco not too long ago. He was saying he's getting stabbed in the ass and everything. So any sort of protection you can get out there is certainly the best. Now, you're, you were talking about going from Memphis. You went to Mid-South. I know we had a stop down in, in Georgia along the way as well. And there was a lot of guys that you were managed or that you were their manager. Of course, Midnight Express probably being the most famous. But guys like Jesse Barr and, of course, uh, exotic Adrian Street, who's a very underrated talent, uh, a guy named Crusher Bloomfield, who a lot of people are going to know better as the one-man gang, multiple others. Now, Midnight Express aside, who were some of the guys that you certainly enjoyed with and maybe at this stage in your career maybe learn the most from? Uh, talk to us about some, some of the talent that you managed the, uh, other than the Midnight Express from back in those days. Well, you know, in, in, in Memphis, uh, uh, you mentioned Adrian Street, Jesse Barr, of course, Crusher Broomfield, the one-man gang. He, he was a rookie himself then. I told him, I said, when I managed you, I set your career back five years. You'd only been wrestling a year and a half at the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then, uh, you know, we, we, I spent the summer of 83 in Georgia managing guys like uh, Norman Frederick Charles III, who was one of the Royal Kangaroos, uh, Carl Fergie, Frank Morrell, the Angel, Guys like that uh, learned a lot from from Daddy Frank, Frank Morell, who I complained one time about the payoff. I said, "Well, we drove all that way, three hundred miles each way, and only got fifty dollars." He said, "Kid, have you ever seen fifty dollars worth of scrambled eggs and bacon on a plate?" <laughs> <laughs> learned a lot from him. Then, of course, I was with the Midnight Express, not exclusively, but almost exclusively for seven years, from at the end of '83 to the end of '90. But also during that time, I got a chance to manage. Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch, who was one of the most entertaining guys inside and outside the ring and a legendary talent, and you could learn from Dick Murdoch just by riding in the car with him and spent some time in the late 80s with Dr. Death Steve Williams, who we had known in Mid-South Wrestling, and, and he joined the Midnight Express for six-man tag matches. And then, of course, uh, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, um, I paired Stan Lane up with Tom Pritchard as the Heavenly Bodies, and then later... You know, when Stan decided to retire, uh, Jimmy Del Rey took his spot, but I, Dr. Tom and I remain, you know, friends to this day. And then uh, in the WWF in the 90s, had a lot of fun managing Yokozuna when he was WWF champion, and, of course, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog when they were tag champions, Vader, and, uh, you know, a few guys there. And, and then uh, uh, my managing career at the end of the 90s came to mostly to a close as I got more involved in, working in the office, matchmaking, uh, talent relations, training, developmental, and et cetera, and, uh, you know, opened up some new facets of my career. But, uh, but the Midnight Express still remains, 
the most fun I had in the ring, the most uh, accolades, or we got most fun I had outside the ring, actually, and in the ring, most accolades, and, and the way most people remember me, and I'm happy with that because Dennis Condry, Bobby Eaton, and Stan Lane, the two incarnations of the Midnight Express, were the best tag team in the business at the time. At at uh, at the, any time that they climbed in the ring, and we tore the house down every night, and I couldn't have done it without those guys. Very Absolutely. good, very good. You get no argument here that they were the best tag team in the business, that's for sure. Uh, so, again, we know you're pressed for time here, Jim. Uh, part one of our two-part interview with you. We'll be looking forward to having you back. So, well, and uh, I'm going to we... come back because I want to tell all the folks, jimcornett.com, we're in the process of revamping the website, and this has been going on all summer, but I've actually been working on a lot of non-wrestling projects, including my landscaping at my property, which is I'm getting a lot of sun and a lot of exercise. I've been on a diet this year, lost 50 pounds, feeling in great shape, staying away from wrestling because people in wrestling these days make me crazy. But uh, I invite everybody to go to jimcornett.com, not only now, but in a month or six weeks or so, when everything's going to be revamped, there's going to be a lot of wrestling and pop culture and non-wrestling content. Got a podcast in the works that we're, uh, we're discussing that will be starting before the end of the year. Uh, Mark James and I have several other book projects uh, in the works, and I'm going to have no shortage of things to plug. The more, I try to re- the more I try to retire, the busier I get for some reason. I don't know how that works. Absolutely. Well, you're always welcome here on WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum to plug anything you like. We're happy to have you. Always glad to hear some of your great stories from your days gone by in the ring and whatever you're up to these days. Sounds like you got a lot of... Uh, oars in the water, so to speak, now. But before we go, we'd be remiss, as you were just touching on, uh, the Midnight Express. Obviously, who you were most famous for managing, like you were just saying, whether it was Dennis Condry or with Stan Lane paired with Bobby Eaton. Um, when you went to Mid-South under working for Bill Watts, uh, if I'm correct, was the origin of the Midnight Express. Just wondering, where did that idea come about, the name, who decided to put Dennis and Bobby together originally, and who decided that you would be with them? Well, actually, the the original Midnight Express was Dennis Condry and Randy Rose uh, back in the old Alabama territory in, in the very early 80s, and they had uh, some moderate success, but uh, Bill Watts came to Memphis to do a talent trade with Jerry Jarrett. Because at the time, uh, the Memphis wrestling, uh, the you know business had had a really strong summer in in '83, but there were way too many guys in the area, and Bill Watts's territory, meanwhile, was in somewhat of a of a slump, and he needed a talent change. So they decided that uh, Jarrett said, "You can have anybody I got except Lawler," and Watts said, "Well, you can have anybody I got except Junkyard Dog." And uh, Watts came to the Coliseum, looked at the talent, and decided to pick Dennis Condry, Bobby Eaton, myself, the Rock and Roll Express, Terry Taylor, and Bill Superstar Dundee to be his booker. And uh, Dennis at the time was a heel. Bobby was a babyface, and I wasn't managing either one of them. But uh, he saw that both of them were tremendous talents in the ring, and uh, he thought they needed a manager because Bobby is noted for being a man of few words, and Dennis can cut a promo, but uh, at the same time he thought that it would add to the package to have a manager, and he asked Dennis Condry, because I didn't even speak to him. I was low on the totem pole then. I was scared. That's Bill Watts. I don't want to go up to him. You know, he's an important person, right? But uh, uh, Watts asked Dennis Condry, he said, can uh, can that kid talk? And Dennis said, he can talk his ass off. So <laughs> so Watts decided to put us together, and, and Dundee uh, obviously uh, – had worked with us quite a bit in in the Memphis area. I'd known Bill since I started as a photographer in '76, and uh, uh, basically, uh, Dennis uh, he asked Dennis Watts did uh, well. Can you have a name for the team? And Dennis suggested the Midnight Express, and uh, I contributed the music, uh, the the infamous entrance music because that was from the movie The Midnight Express back when you could play commercial music and didn't get your ass sued off. <laughs> and uh, off we went as the Midnight Express in Mid South Wrestling, and and I'm pleased to say that that was our career break. Uh, not only did we have the best business year that Mid South Wrestling ever had, and set gate records in every city uh, against the Rock and Roll Express, against Bill Watts and Junkyard Dog, against a variety of the teams, the Fantastics, 
but also we made a hundred grand a piece, and I was twenty two years old main event in the superdome that was a thrill, and we got such a reputation in the wrestling industry that we could pretty much write our own ticket uh as to where we wanted to go after that and we spent six unfulfilling months in Dallas working for the Von Erichs and World Class Wrestling, but it was a come down in money, and also uh, we never really got a chance to to wrestle the uh, inevitable feud with the Von Erichs, so we stayed there for six months enjoying the short trips, and then we took Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes up on both of their offers to come to work for Jim Crockett Promotions, hit TBS, and the rest, as they say, not only is history, but maybe a good uh, topic to pick up on in part two. Absolutely. Well, that that sounds like a good starting point for part two. We've touched on Mama Cornette. We've touched on the tennis racket. We've touched on the origins of the Midnight Express. Well, hey, now watch it, watch it, watch out now touching on Mama Cornette because, you know, (laughs) but uh, if anybody anybody wants the full story of the Midnight Express, I encourage them to check out the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette 25th anniversary scrapbook available at jimcornette.com, the Wrestling Observer Book of the Year from 2010. And uh, uh, a lot of color, and it's it's a combination rock and roll tour book and uh, all around wrestling fans nerd fest book where it has the results, the place, the date, the opponent of every match we had in our seven years as a team, uh, tremendously il- illustrated with 36 pages of color and hundreds of pictures and uh, some behind the scenes, never before seen stuff like booking sheets, paycheck stubs, memos from WCW and Watts and Mid South and World Class and uh, even some great ribs and road stories. So uh, that book is, is something we're proud of also, and it is available at the aforementioned jimcornette.com. Fantastic. Terrific stuff here. Now let's, let, let's do a quick review here. we got jimcornette.com. It's under construction, still operational. But it, it, it's operational, but it's going to look twice as good in the next four to six weeks as it does right now. And I've truthfully, I've spent so much time over the past few years obsessing over my Ring of Honor project that I did not update it as I should, and now there's a bunch of uh, new material ready to go up. And But you can still find a bunch of cool wrestling memorabilia, these books, some videos, and other various ephemera. And I'm branching out into comic books because I've been a lifelong comic book collector, and I've got 10,000 Silver Age comic books sitting in my vault that uh, I'm trying to find good homes for because I'm turning them into landscaping, and they're they're actually sitting in the way of my four thousand wrestling videotapes. So, so something something's got to go. <laughs> well, we'd like to have some dibs on the videotapes if they ever go up for up for auction. That's for sure, Jim. We got a couple other things here. I wanted to just touch base on. You mentioned a great website, MemphisWrestlingHistory.com. If that's correct, I want to get that out to our listeners. Rags, paper, and pins, the merchandising of Memphis Wrestling. That is Jim Cornette's book. That is on newsstands now at jimcornette.com, co-written by Mark James. We're going to make. We're gonna cut off now, let you get on to your things. I know you said you had quite a few engagements this evening, so we'll let you roll on that. I did make a mental note as well. Next time we have you on, I definitely want to hear a good story about Dick Murdoch. Well, I can give you a few, and that we'll we'll start that off because uh, uh, our run in uh, uh, the NWA and WCW with Crockett Promotions started my wonderful relationship with with uh, Captain Dickey, as I used to call him, and and uh, there's there's a lot of Murdoch stories we can tell. Fantastic, fantastic stuff, Scum. Anything you want to add in here right before we let Mister Cornette head out? Well, we just want to thank Jim for. Coming on WGD Weekly, we'll look forward to getting into some Captain Redneck stories. We'll look forward to maybe a little Smoky Mountain Wrestling, maybe uh, get behind the curtain and his work in the WWF with the creative side of the business in our next portion of the interview, if you wouldn't mind. This, this, this may have to be that. a mini-series. We, you, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's hey, great. Three, three sure words. It's, it's like fucking too. Vader. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, hey, thanks, guys, very much for having me. I appreciate it, and uh, and uh, just get back a hold of me. We'll do this again sometime. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Jim, and uh, we'll let you go, and we'll get back together when you get everything up and running with a new website and all that good stuff. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks, Thank Jim. You. We'll be in Talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, scum. That was Jim Cornette. I am totally psyched. I can't believe we just were able to talk to one of my favorite guys of all time. I'm pretty bent out of shape. I'm so happy right now. What about you, man? It's fucking Vader. <laughs> Good 
nice, nice, to, nice to hear for as many chuckles as you and I, and I have gotten out of that. You throw that in there, and even James E. got a little laugh out of it. Uh, like you said, looking forward to part two, another one of our favorite guys that he's going to start out with. Did I get that correct? Is some Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch stories. Wow, that ought to be great. Imagine that, sitting in that car with Bobby Eaton and whether it was Condry or Lane and Dick Murdoch had to have certainly been an animal. But maybe maybe with that Vader comment, maybe next time Steve will get a – Sure, Jim will have some opinions on some of the people he's worked with in creative. Be interested to hear his take on the whole uh, Jim Hurd era, maybe. Maybe he'll have a maybe he'll have a few words about our old friend that we from time to time stick up for in the form of uh, Vinnie Rue, possibly. <laughs> oh man, I sure hope so. You know, scum. You, when you're looking all over YouTube, I remember about oh I don't know, it's probably two or three years ago. I just got on this Jim Cornette kick, and I'm like, dude, let me look up everything that I can find on YouTube on Jim Cornette. And it was always like, you know, three-minute clips, four-minute clips of him telling a story. So I am on the overall, when this product is finished and we have part one and part two in the books, we're going to be able to have a solid outlet to just simply listen, to just kick back and listen to one of the best storytellers, whether it be in the ring or backstage, whatever story you want to hear out of Jim Cornette's mouth, it's going to be great. We got it all in one place. And I'll tell you this, man, we talked about this um, prior to doing this setup because we knew of the time situations with, you know, having to do two parts. Folks, when we get done doing these two parts, not only will they be released each weekly as, you know, as the show, like you're going to be listening to right now, of course, part two down the road, but I will get this back into WGD weekly studios and put that together all in one show as well. Come and listen to it. We'll have it all put together in one show as a special somewhere down the line. I give you our word on that. We'll have it all done. Um, so it'll be one outlet for you guys to listen to this whole thing, not to mention the individual shows as well. So scum, Dick Murdoch, Midnight Express, Mid South Wrestling, the the talent trade from Memphis down to Mid South with Bill Watts. We got through a small portion of what is the whole of Jim Cornette's career, and I'm really excited to hearing more in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I said at the end, it was good. You know, we touched on his beginnings there, and how he came in as sort of the super fan, you know, the merchandise guy, and then Mama Cornette and. Uh, Hey, you who know. you touched on, and and you clearly crossed the line with with James E. Cornette. Well, I, I, again, I, he doesn't have to worry about anything there. No disrespect to Jim or his uh, quote unquote mama, but I'm not sure exactly of her age. But Jimmy's up there now. I, I don't think he has to worry about the scum touching on Mama Cornette in any way. Well, I'm sure he'll sleep at night well knowing that. <laughs> As we're going forward here, I wanted to thank you once again for turning into WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum. I'm interested in his time at Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and I know that we'll touch on that in the next show. And you know what's exciting to me is that he's redoing the website, jimcornette.com, and he's going to also kind of cross over into some mainstream entertainment. He was talking about some comic books. A lot going on with him still. And like he said, busier now more than ever after he's kind of retired from active duty in the ring. Uh, kind of a shame we don't get to see him on Monday nights or Thursday nights or whatever the case may be. But good to see Jim Cornette still doing a lot of things. And once again, he's got that book, Rags, Paper, and Pins, of Merchandising of Memphis Wrestling, out on newsstands now, redoing the jimcornet.com website. You can still go there and check out all his stuff and many more things to come in the future for him, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Sounds like he's real busy. I mean, the pop culture, it would be interesting to get some uh, service and restaurant reviews out of Jim Cornet. <laughs> he's kind of infamous for some of his outtakes. And, you know, he certainly has his brand that he's loyal to, let's say, over the years. So, you know, yeah. Very interested to see what, what where that goes on the site as far as the pop culture goes. Getting back to our part two that will be coming up, Steve, um, I would be really interested to see not only Dick Murdoch, but some stories about those other guys that he mentioned managing. I'm sure, I mean, Owen Hart is a definitely well-known as a 
guy with a sense of humor that always was a quick wit and, you know, always pulling the jokes and the ribs, I guess they call them. So be interested to hear maybe some Owen and Bulldog stories at Yokozuna. I mean, must have been pretty interesting traveling with a 650-pound Samoan when he was carrying the <laughs> WWF strap, right? I, I mean, just the guys that he was associated with over the years, the time in TNA, that whole incident, that I'm sure we'll probably touch on that, like we said when we talked creative, you know, the whole incident with the back and forth and the emails with Terry Taylor and things like that. So I, I really just can't wait to dig in. I, it was such a thrill to have him on and to hear his beginnings how he got into the business and some of the guys that he used to work with, you know, the one man gang back when he was running his crusher Bloomfield exotic Adrian street, who you had mentioned is one, a very underrated talent, but way ahead of his time. Uh, I mean, the guys worked with everybody. So hey, there's nobody that has not you know, had a cup of coffee, let's say, or, or a can of Sprite, I guess you would say with Jim Cornette. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, he did his best as a, as a manager to put every one of his guys into a position to be in a, in, in a pretty good shape when it came to looking at whatever title they were chasing. They always had matches. And I know that people will have, you know, complaints about the Vader and the Shawn Michaels stuff, which to me, of course, is highly entertaining when you consider the backstory there. But, you know, moving on from there, we got Fred Ottman next week, Tugboat Man. I'm pretty excited about him. And the week after that, the Russian Bear Ivan Koloff. We got a lot going on. I know these guys, and I, and I can certainly tell our listeners, you know, we're busy guys and we have to record when we can. So we have both of those interviews already recorded. So they're fantastic. Uh, we certainly, again, now no spoilers, nothing being spoiled. Fred Ottman was a ton of fun, literally and figuratively. Great guy. Big teddy bear, like he says. And I, I hope you guys enjoy next week's show because it's going to be pretty good with, with Fred Ottman, Tugboat, Uncle Fred, all the nicknames that, of course, come the legendary Shockmaster. That's right, the legendary Shockmaster, a little blip in his career that at first I don't think he liked talking too much about, but over the years the guy's got a great sense of humor. You know, his certainly – found it the humor in that situation anyway and has actually embraced it and has no problem getting a chuckle out of it uh ivan koloff the following week is just a fantastic guest to have on with unbelievable history we've had a few guys that date back whether it was bushwhacker luke whether it was larry zabisco guys that go way back ivan koloff stretches as long as anybody we've had it got to be about 50 years in the business uh like you had said steve he's been through a lot of personal stuff to where he has found god so to speak he's an ordained minister at this point so I don't know, you know, I don't know if the people say that they wrestle with their demons. I wonder if somewhere along the way I can't help with uh, my own twisted, let's say, sense of humor. Do you think Koloff ever latched onto the chain? I mean, I'm pretty sure that would have done big money, a Russian chain match between Koloff and Jesus. Oh, boy. All right, moving on from there. Jim Cornette part one went pretty well. I'm pretty excited about part two. Actually, I'm very excited about part two. Got a lot going on here in the near future. November 30th, Russell Cade, Winston-Salem, North Carolina at the Benton Convention Center. Definitely swing out if you're on the East Coast. We'll have fun. We'll be going nuts. Dude, we're gonna, it's Steve and the Scum in the middle of about 70 legends. So figure out what we're going to be doing all day. We're going to be going ape shit, and I hope that you guys can come down and join us. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Pictures are plenty from that, maybe a couple of live spots. I know that, Scum, we were able to get some footage recently of a couple of our guests um, doing some video for us, just a little clip here and there, and we'll try to get that out to you guys uh, throughout the course of the next couple of shows. Um, what did you think of uh, those, the video of Jake Roberts last week, Scum? Yeah, yeah it was great. I, it, Jake was fantastic that he was willing to – take the time to do a little promo spot for us. we got a couple more that will be coming up. and it's, it, it's great to have some of these guys that are willing to give back. You know, you've been fans of them for so long, and the guys like Jake that were thrilled, you know, that even to have them put the show over like that. I mean, Jake the Snake Roberts, man. I remember watching him when I was 
eight, nine years old, battling with Ronnie Garvin or his, his feud with Ricky Steamboat and, you know, the promos that he would cut on them or when he, The Undertaker came in and the Macho Man Savage shoot. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's kind of overwhelming and very flattering and almost humbling to have Jake the Snake Roberts coming on and putting the show over like that. You know, he cut, he's cut promos on everybody and to have him spit in our call letters out is pretty awesome I, I can't thank him enough can't thank any of the guys enough yeah i know totally and our listeners man all, everybody that's been a part of the show whether you're listening whether you're watching it on youtube or of course all the performers that have you know committed to our show and come on every single one of them have performed awesome every show that we've had I, I, we most, obviously you and i scum as fans will listen to them as fans because it gets a little hectic when you're actually trying to record and get everything done. You've got to kind of listen to this stuff a couple of times to make sure, you know, the audio is correct. And, you know, we're taking a look at a lot of different things when we're trying to put the product out. But I know that it's sometimes you, you get lost in it and you don't have a chance to sit back and listen to these shows. So for every one of the guys, Buff Bagwell, shit, way back, Leilani Kai, of course, Precious Paul Ellering. I mean, I think, you know, when you look at the genesis of what we're doing here, Paul Ellering – once we were able to sit down with him, thanks to Rachel, his daughter, who's a sweetheart, she listens to our show, and, and I know that she helps us out on Twitter quite a bit, too. It's, it's great to kind of see the evolution of where we've been to where we are now. So many more guests in the future, and it's all thanks to you know some wonderful people that have decided to spend a couple hours out of their day to join us. Absolutely. Go, going on that same page, Steve, when you mentioned the uh, first few guests there. Again, when we d- didn't really have any basis to go on, not much of a crowd, just some ideas, some good ideas and some passion for what we were doing, got to throw a thanks out to a couple other people that, you know, took a chance on Steve and the Scum. And Scott Hudson first was fantastic, came on, told stories with us, was like we were sitting around watching Monday night television with the guy. I mean, huge fan. He came across. Great guy. And uh, Marcus Buff Bagwell. I mean, it's just been fantastic. I mean, Buff came on, spoke with us for that interview uh, immediately. You know, had we didn't we didn't have much to offer to him at that point in time. And he, he come on, a huge star during one of the biggest periods of wrestling, part of the NWO. He came on, gave us a great interview, was very candid, was very open, was very honest. And since then, he's been helpful to us. I mean, you know as well as I do, Steve, that video stuff and the things that we were able to get from the show a couple weeks back there, Buff set that up for us. I mean, the guy has been very accommodating. So Scott Hudson, Buff Bagwell, along with, like you said, Rachel and Paul Ellering and Leilani Kai way back when you first started out. Just a heartfelt thank you, I mean, without people like that, to get us some recognition, to get us some type of name behind the product. Maybe everything else wouldn't have been possible. So a very big thank you to Rachel, to Paul, to Leilani, to Scott Hudson, and to Mark Bagwell. Absolutely, Scum, and I can't wait to see some of these guys in person at WrestleCade shake their hands, say thanks again for all that they've done for us for our show. We're going to keep cranking on, steamrolling it for everybody. Listen to our show. We're, we're on. We try to give you anywhere between an hour and two, and we understand that it's kind of longer to sit down in front of YouTube. Keep in mind, folks, right on your screen, if you're watching this on YouTube, search WGD Weekly anywhere in social media, and you'll find us on Facebook, on Twitter on iTunes, and, of course, on YouTube. All WGD Weekly with Stephen the Scum. We're all over the Internet. Download us on your, your iMachine. Uh, folks, if you don't have iTunes and you want the MP3 to this so you can just listen to it on your mobile device um, without having to go to YouTube if there's some sort of Internet issue, email us at stephenthescum at gmail.com. I will see to it, the Scum will see to it, that you get an MP3 copy. We will email you a link to TalkShoe.com. It's kind of an odd website when it comes to, I don't want to just say, hey, TalkShoe.com slash WGD Weekly. It won't work like that. So personally contact us if you like. Leave us a uh, message on our page at WGD Weekly or, of course, on Twitter. Let us know if you want the MP3 format, and I will email it to you or send it to you somehow through social media. Um, 
And that way you'll be able to have, you know, for Android or for your tablet or whatever the case may be if you don't use iTunes, which is not a problem. We don't really advertise it, like I said, because of the, you know, the odd website that we use, TalkShoe, um, to get everything put together for the week. But you can also go there and stream it. So if you want to try TalkShoe.com and just search WGD Weekly, and if, if you can't find it, add with Steve and the Scum. I'm sure there's very few things on there that have the word the Scum in it. So I'm pretty sure you'll be able to find it. You can actually stream it right from the website as well. So we wanted to thank you once again. No matter what outlet, whatever media outlet you listen to, thank you. It's been a great show. We got fucking Vader, man. It's Jim Cornette. I'm totally psyched about that. Dick Murdoch, right out of the shoot the next time he comes on. Another favorite guy of mine. Great stuff all the way around, Scum. We got Tugboat next week, Fred Ottman. And uh, that's all I got. All right. Well, yeah, it was fantastic. Pleasure doing business with Jim Cornette. Can't wait to have him back on. Real excited next week. Great interview. Great show coming up with Fred Ottman. Everyone's going to want to tune into that. The following week, the Russian Bear, Ivan Koloff. So much more waiting in the wings here on WGD Weekly. That's all I got, too, Steve. Um, I think I'm going to hop my car, head down, see if I can't get some of that fantastic service at the Dairy Queen drive through And other than that, we'll see everybody next week. <laughs> Rags, paper, and pins. The Merchandising of Memphis Wrestling by Jim Cornette, co-written by Mark James. Don't forget to get a copy. Go to jimcornette.com. You can order it there. You can order it a lot of different places. Thanks once again for listening, all you savages, and we'll see you next week. It's fucking Vader. Have a good week, people. <laughs>